Jim was a man who went to meet the President of the United States. And Jim was very nervous because he was a backwoods country fella who really didn't understand all the proper things, kind of like myself. I, I wouldn't know which fork or spoon to use, you know. And he was sort of that way. So he thought, I'll just do whatever the president does. So, you know, if, if he picks up a certain dish, I'll pick up mine. That way I'll know I'll be safe. So the president takes a little saucer and he pours a little bit of milk in it. Jim thought that was weird, but he said, hey, you know, if he's doing it, I, I probably need to do it too. So he did the same thing. Then the president opens a little packet of sugar and he dumps it in the saucer with the milk and he begins to mix it up. Jim, he's like, well, man, I, I guess I'll do it too. So he opens his sugar and puts it in there and he mixes it in. Then the president takes the saucer and sets it on the ground for his cat. <laughs> and Jim knew immediately, you know, he had been caught. He said to himself, I should have just been myself. I should have just let the president know my faults and then I wouldn't have looked near as bad. You know, Jacob is a man that we read about in the Bible who revealed some of his faults. But I believe there's some good lessons that we can learn from that. You know, he's very authentic, this guy is. He, he's just himself, you know. There are other people in the Bible who have faults as well, but I, I think Jacob stands out to me because what you see is what you get. Now, before we go there, I want you to notice this passage in Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 46. No matter what our faults are, God knows what's on the inside. You know, many people who were sitting at that table probably thought terribly of Jim, you know? Probably think, oh, that old backwoods, redneck, he, he don't even know how to come eat at the president's table. But God doesn't see that. In fact, the Bible says, in, according to the book of Luke, you'll notice this, uh, in Luke chapter 9 and verse 46, there arose a reasoning among them which should be the greatest, and Jesus perceiving the thoughts of their heart. He took a child and he set him by him and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive a child in my name receiveth me. Whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. He that is least among you, the same shall be great. There's a picture here. I want to share it with you. I want you to know that this picture has not been edited in any way. Kind of even a little bit blurry. You know, it's not a very good picture. But I looked at this picture and I looked at it and looked at it and I thought, what in the world is going on here, you know? But then I read what the caption said below the picture. You have to turn it around. And when you turn it upside down, it makes sense. It's just a rock in the water. But if they never would have told me that I needed to change my perspective on how I look at it, I'd still be looking at it like that. There's a lesson that I learned, hopefully, about people and about myself when I look at the life of Jacob. I need to sort of adjust the way that I see things in other people and in myself. And I hope that's sort of our lesson for tonight. I want to give you these in a rapid-fire fashion, but I ask you to open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 34. This will be our text for tonight. And uh, while you're turning there, I'm reminded of this passage uh, it's found in, let's see, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. Somehow I didn't make it on the screen there, but you remember that uh, God was choosing a king for Israel. And it's interesting what God qualified to be the king. Israel wanted this mighty man to be this dominant warrior, but God said, no, 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 we tried that. That didn't work. So in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance nor his height of stature, for I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Jacob, in my opinion, was a man who was a lot like David when David said, My heart is fixed, O God. Before it can be fixed, what has to happen to it? 
it's got to be broken. Jacob's heart, along with others in the Bible, their hearts were broken on one occasion, and we learned some good lessons from them. So let's look at Psalm chapter 34, if, if you're there. I asked you to turn there a moment ago. Psalm chapter 34 and verse 17 and 18, but uh, I've got some earlier ones there for the context, okay? Notice this. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and he delivereth them out of all their troubles, and the Lord is nigh unto them who are of a broken heart, and saveth such who be of a contrite spirit. I want to share this poem with you, and then we'll begin. It is weird that my heart is right when I'm wrong, and when I'm weak, then I'm strong. I will never stumble upon the words that are spoken until I am humbled and broken. I won't listen or know where to start until I grow into a broken heart. So today I pray to be open and to hear it. Help me to be broken and of a contrite spirit. Friend, that's what we're talking about tonight in the life of Jacob. I'm reminded of a man named Billy Hayes. He was in my graduating class at the Memphis School of Preaching, and he was always the class clown. He was hilarious. And uh, he was a country boy from Alabama. In fact, I don't think he's ever left the state of Alabama except to come to the Memphis School of Preaching. <laughs> when he graduated, he went right back to Alabama. But anyway, he did something funny one day. It kind of stuck with me. He had this little fan that he kept on his desk, and he always had it blowing on him. You know, he was wanting to be cool or whatever, and it broke. And he was upset, you know. He's like, my fan, it's broken. So anyway, he dropped it on the ground and just kicked it around a little bit. <laughs> and everybody's laughing at him. They're like, what in the world are you doing? He said, look, this is how we fix stuff in Alabama. We just break it. <laughs> you know, that always stuck with me. When I was preparing this lesson, I thought of Billy Hayes. When a heart is broken is when it can be fixed. Jacob teaches me that lesson. Let's go to Genesis 32. This is going to sort of be our entire lesson for tonight from Genesis 32. I want to begin in verse 1, okay? We're, we're going to talk about he learned the tender love of God when he was broken. He learned the tactical love of God when he was broken. He learned the tough love of God, and he learned also the transforming love of God. So this chapter to me is a beautiful chapter about J Jacob's life. And you may remember, he was on the run for 20 years until he met someone who he wrestled with all night. I believe that person that he wrestled with all night to be Jesus Christ himself before he came to the earth. I know that he said he saw God face to face, so in one way or another, he wrestled with God. And I, whether it's the Holy Spirit, God the Father, uh, I don't know, but at any rate, we'll learn a little bit about it tonight. Number one. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host, and he called the name of that place, notice, Double Camp. Mahanaim, that in the, the Hebrew means double camp. You know, I'm finding something about God's nature too, because the tender love of God teaches me about his patience. Each of these things are going to be attached to something, okay? The tender love of God teaches me about his patience. The tactical love of God teaches me about his plan, so on and so forth, okay? So first of all, I learned something about God's love. He is very patient with Jacob because Jacob's been on the run for 20 years, and what has he done? He has stolen his brother's birthright and his blessing. What he did was... Him and his mother got together and they decided, you know what, uh, we'll just trick your daddy since he's blind and he's old. We'll put fur on your arm to make it feel like Esau's arm and you go in and you act like Esau and your father will bless you and give you his birthright and blessing. And after he did it and Esau found out, Esau wanted to kill him. So Jacob ran. He said, oh, by the way, I need to go find me a wife at Laban's house. He stayed at Laban's house for 14 years. So he finally decides to come back, 
And he's on the road in Genesis 32 to meet who? Esau. He is finally coming back home to meet his brother after 20 years. He's been on the run for all this time. And God says, wait, wait, wait a minute. We're going to name this place Mahanaim because I've got a message for you and I'm going to camp with you tonight. Friend, I want to tell you, God is very patient with all of us. I think of these passages. You could just write these in your margin. I'm just going to notice them quickly. Paul asked the brethren at Rome, he said, do you despise the riches and goodness of forbearance and not knowing that the long-suffering of God will lead you to repentance? Friend, God is good, and he is very patient with us. I think of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20 through 22 when Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will open unto me, I will come in unto him, will sup with him, and he with me. Jesus is knocking at people's doors when they should be knocking on his I'm reminded of a boy who came into the room and he was crying. His mother asked him why. She said, why are you so upset? He said, well, <laughs> Dad, he, he hit his finger with a hammer. His mother said, well, you shouldn't be crying about that. Dad's a man. He can take care of himself. You should have just laughed at your dad. He said, that's what I did, and I got a spanking. <laughs> You know, God is not like that. He's not a tyrant. You know what David said about God's nature, and I learn it from Jacob. He said that God is a father who, who pities his children. In fact, in Psalm 103, verse 13 and 14, for some reason I've got mixed up on the passage here, but it says, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. He knows that we are but dust. So, you know, God is one of these people who's very patient. He's patient with Jacob after he's been gone for all this time. You think about the parable of the prodigal son. He went out, wasted his substance with riotous living, and when he came back home, what did the father do? He ran to meet his son. He didn't wait on the porch, rocking in his rocking chair, you know, with his sweet tea in his hand wait for his son to come crawling back to him. He didn't do that. That father ran to meet his son, and the Bible says he fell on his neck and he kissed him. All that time, he'd been waiting for his son to come home. The tender love of God is very patient. The tactical love of God has a plan. All right, let's go back to, to Psalm, or, uh, Genesis chapter 32. Let's pick up there in verse 3. Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak, notice, to my lord Esau. <laughs> He's buttering him up now, isn't he? Thy servant Jacob. There he is again. Seth thus, I have sojourned with Laban and, and stayed there until now. Notice verse 5. He said, I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and men servants and women servants. I have sent to tell, notice, my Lord that I may find grace in his sight. Look at verse 18. Then shalt thou say, they be thy servant, Jacob's, and it is a present sent unto my Lord. Verse 20. Verse 20. And you say, moreover, behold, thy servant Jacob is behind him. You see, he's buttering up Esau. <laughs> he's like, woo, we better be nice to Esau because he's been mad at me for 20 years. But you know what? If you've been gone from God for that long, there has to be a plan. It's not going to be easy to come back after you've been gone for 20 years. And I want to tell you today that it's, it's very tough to, to notice the tactical love of God because there, there are some differences and some changes that are having to happen in Jacob's life in order for him to do this. And I want to tell you, I think even more highly of him, before he committed his crimes, I think highly of him even more now after them that he's coming back home. Do you? I mean, yeah, before he 
tricked his brother and before he tricked his father, you know, I thought Jacob, he's a pretty good fella. You know, he's he just all right kid. He wants to do what God says. He loves the Lord. But now, and Jacob has really changed a lot of what I think about him because he said, you know what, I need to face what I have done. And he's ready to fix it. Sometimes it takes a little bit of pain to accomplish God's plan. For instance, you think about what David did. And David sort of wrote some things that tell me he went through a lot of pain. You read Psalm 51, you can't help but hear David crying. In Psalm 119 and verse 66, David said, teach me good judgment and knowledge for I have believed thy commandments and before I was afflicted I went astray. But notice, now have I kept your word. God's love sometimes is something that's very patient. The good nature of God will bring us back. But other times, there will be a little bit of pain, some punishment there that will also bring us back. I think Jacob teaches me that as well. All right, there, there's some other things that I could notice here, but I want to give you one more thing, and it's found in Jonah chapter 2. Okay, let's go to Jonah chapter 2. Let's talk about this tactical plan just for a minute. Jonah's plan was a little bit different, but there are a lot of similarities, okay? He also had to come back home, and God allowed some circumstances to happen in Jonah's life that sort of uh, broke him a little bit, okay? The language that he describes here in Jonah chapter 2, beginning in verse 2, to me is, uh, uh, it's always sort of humorous to me, the way he describes him being in the belly of a whale, <laughs> okay? You're like, Jonah, uh, tell me about when you were in the whale's belly. Well, notice what he says here. He said, for thou hast cast me into the deep, into the midst of the sea. The floods were compassed me about, all the billows and waves were passed over me, and then I said, I'm cast out of thy sight. Here it is. Yet will I look again to thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. Now here it is. The weeds were wrapped about my head. <laughs> I could just picture Jonah in the belly of a whale, and he's got a wig of weeds on his head, you know? But I'll tell you this. That's what it took for Jonah. It took Jacob sort of seeing the light a little bit to come back home. It took Jonah seeing the light a little bit to come back home. But it's interesting to me, it didn't stop here. We move on to number three and notice the tough love of God. Notice after all this, he decides that he wants to fight God. Look here, let's begin, if you will, in uh, verse 22 of Genesis 32. Here's what it says. He rose up that night and he took... Uh, his two wives, his two women servants, and his 11 sons, and he passed over the ford. That is like a little brook. It's called Jabbok. And he took them. He sent them over the brook, and he sent over uh, that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and he wrestled with a man that was with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint and he wrestled, or as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? Jacob answered, he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be no more called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him, he said, tell me, I pray thee, what is thy name? And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask me after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of that place Paniel, which means the face of God. It's interesting, when I was taking the Hebrew class, one of my vocabulary words was Panim, faces. So it's interesting to see, like, I'm like, man, I, I felt like that was the only thing I learned in that class, by the way. <laughs> and I, and I, it clicked with me when I read this. I was like, now, wait a minute. He saw God's Panim, the faces of God. 
Now, no man has seen God face to face and lived, but he said, I have seen God. So that tells me he wrestled with something more than was just a man. He wrestled with God. The sad fact is, you look there in verse 30, he said, I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. But he walked away. Having experienced the tough love of God, and he limped for the rest of his life. He was broken. His ego was broken, his leg was broken, and I'll tell you what, his heart was broken. And that's exactly what Jacob needed on this occasion. You look there in uh, verse 31, he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him. What was he doing? He was limping on his thigh. Therefore, the children of Israel, they do not eat of the sinew which shrank. And when they eat the animals, they won't eat that part, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. The tough love of God is sometimes lasting a long time. Let me give you this. The tender love of God is patient. The tactical love of God has a plan. The tough love of God is a punishment. Jacob experienced that every time he took, he took a step. There were others in the Bible, too, who experienced that. I'll give you this very quickly. God, in my opinion, teaches us two things when we're broken. He teaches us to rely on him and to respect him. These are the same two lessons that Jacob learned when he limped away, <laughs> you know? He's like, uh, from now on, I'm going to rely on God. <laughs> and from now on, I'm going to respect God. And there were others who were taught this same lesson. In fact, I'll give you this just pretty quickly. In Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2, he said, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee in these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, and notice, to know what was in your heart. He said, I want to know whether or not you'll rely on me. When I give you this bread from heaven, when I give you the water from the rock, the Bible even says the shoes on their feet wouldn't wear out. God wanted them to know, you can rely on me. You keep reading. He, he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. He fed thee with manna which thou did not know, and neither did your fathers know that he might make you to know that but by... Uh, man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So these are two things God teaches us when we're broken. The first one, to rely on God. The second one is to respect God. I'll notice this quickly and move on to my last point. Nobody learned this lesson more powerfully than Nebuchadnezzar the king. I mean, if you think of a man in the Bible who was taught, I better respect God or he will punish me, it's Nebuchadnezzar. It's interesting how Nebuchadnezzar thought of himself. You know, he's already built this golden image. He commanded the people to bow down to it when they heard the music played. And here's what he said about himself. Is not this great Babylon which I have built for the house and the kingdom of, by, of might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? God said, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> You're going too far with this now. I've been listening to this. You've been making people bow down to your image. You've been saying all this stuff, but God said, I've had enough because you didn't do this. I am the one who gave you this kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar. To thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. And until seven times pass over you, he will eat grass like an ox. The, the claws of his hands will be like bird claws, and his hair will be like bird feathers. He did that for seven years. He was literally mentally insane. after seven years came about, God allowed him to come back to himself. It's interesting what Nebuchadnezzar said after he came back into his right mind. 
He blessed the Most High God, and he praised him. And he honored him that liveth forever and ever. He learned a hard lesson that he had better have respect for the God of heaven. Fourth and finally, we talk about the tender love of God is patient. We talk about the tactical love of God has a plan. The tough love of God sometimes comes with a punishment, but I like this. The transforming love of God comes with a purpose. I love verses 27 and 28, which we read a moment ago in Genesis 32. God asked Jacob, what is your name? You think, you think he knew what Jacob's name was? You think he knew where Adam was when he asked Adam, where are you? Yes. Jacob's name means schemer. God said, I want you to tell me your name one more time. Because you've been on the run for 20 years. Because of your schemes that you did to your brother and to your dad. Jacob answered him, my name is Jacob. God said, not anymore. Your name is not schemer anymore. Your name is Prince of God from this point on. I can imagine just what in the world is he thinking? He's limping away, <laughs> you know. He, he, he just has wrestled with this being all night long. His leg is out of joint. And he said, man, that was the most terrible lesson I've ever been taught in my life. But I'm a prince of God from now on. The transforming love of God gives people a purpose. I want to tell you tonight, if you've never been broken, that may be why you feel like you have no purpose. I want to encourage you to accept what Jacob had to accept. I hope that I will accept what Jacob had to accept. It's not easy. But in order for us to go forward, sometimes we've got to be changed. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 21, the Bible says, by faith Jacob, when he was dying, he blessed both of his sons and he worshiped, notice, he still has that stick because his leg for the rest of his life was limp. He never forgot the day that he wrestled with God. I hope and pray tonight that you would be willing and ready to obey the gospel if you have not. You know, Christianity is a heart religion. And God says, look, I just want you. Are you willing to come tonight and give God what you have with all of your heart Jesus is waiting for you right now to come back home. If you need to believe and repent of your sins and confess the name of Christ, to be baptized because you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, tonight is the night. Maybe you've obeyed the gospel and you said, you know what, I, I just haven't been faithful. I haven't loved the Lord like I should. I want to fix it today. Will you come home right now as we stand, as we sing?